Okay, so let's start then. Um, hi again, everyone. My name is Luis, and um, I am here with my colleague Alina, and we are part of the Ensemble Outreach team, and we will be delivering the, the workshop today. So um, this workshop is being recorded, and I will share the link with you um, either next week or the following week. So this workshop consists of um, several modules. Each module will follow the following structure. We will start with a presentation where um, we explain what the tool is or what data is being presented and how it is produced and processed. And then we will run through a demonstration where we'll show you how to get this data on Ensemble. And at the end, um, you'll have time to do a few exercises. So um, during the demonstration, feel free to either follow along on your own laptop or, or a computer, or you can just watch me um, do the demonstration. Oops, now these are just a few pictures. <laughs> um, so the materials um, that I will be covering today are available on the training Ensemble training page. So I'm just going to post the link on the chat box. And um, I will uh, just give you a brief overview of this uh, training page. So if you, sorry, if you open a new tab in your browser, uh, just type in training.ensemble.org. and you will uh, land on this page. And here you want to go to the find materials from training um, section here on the left-hand side. So I'm going to click that link. And this is a training page, especially for today's workshop. So I'm going to click on that. And here, that's, it's loading. Sometimes it takes a little while to load, so the page looks a bit funny. But um, here you will find all the materials that I will be using today. So you can find the presentation slides here on the right hand side. Um, we also have a living document. So I'm going to open this document and show you what is in there. And this living document, it just Sorry, uh, this living document just has general information on today's workshops, such as the schedule, uh, links to resources, and at the end of the document on page three, um, there is a section here um, called questions. So if you have any questions that you want to ask um, that might be a bit more complicated to uh, post on the chat box in on Zoom. Um, you can type it in here, and Alina or I will uh, answer it um, as soon as possible. Um, you can, of course, do that on Zoom as well, but um, on the document, it's just a little more, uh, uh, it has a better overview because you can track um, the answers and also start discussions and add more things to it, whereas on Zoom, um, it just might get lost uh, in the th in the messages. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the training page here, and and one more thing I want to show you are the demos and exercises at the bottom of the page. So here we have different tabs and you can click on them, and each of them has um, a demonstration. So it will be the same demonstration that I'll be giving you, but um, if it was too fast for you or if you want to review it, um, it's just um, displayed again here, and you can go through it in your own time. And you also have a section for exercises. So each module that we'll be presenting has um, a number of exercises. 
and um, you can try them out in your in your own time and there are different species so you can choose uh, which species you want to uh, answer and if you are ever stuck um, you can ask us or um, check the text answers in these tabs here so they're hidden um, so that you can try the exercises on your own first. Okay, um, so I'm going to go back to the presentation. And, and I'm just going to show you the agenda for today. So we're going to cover, we're going to be working, we're going to do the workshop from 9 to 1 um, Amsterdam time. And we'll be covering uh, an introduction to Ensemble, a region in detail view module, genes and we were discussing genes and transcripts, um, how to export data on Biomart, and um, we'll be giving some closing remarks for uh, which includes uh, feedback, survey, and also um, also uh, links to where you can find more information or where to find help. And the objectives for today um, are to understand what Ensemble is and what type you can get in Ensemble, how to navigate the browser site, and also where to go for help and documentation. So I'll start with the presentation now, uh, with the first module, which is the introduction to Ensemble. And in this module, I'll be covering uh, why genome browsers are needed, what Ensemble is and what data, what data it offers, how genome assemblies are made, and um, you'll have time for some exercises after I do a brief demonstration. So I'll start off with a bit of background. Sorry, did someone ask anything? <laughs> Okay, that was just my speaker. Um, yeah, if you have questions, just um, just ask away or type it into the in, into the Zoom box. Um, so, in 1977, Fred Sanger and his team sequenced the first genome, which was a bacteriophage, and this paved the way to for sequencing genomes of more complex organisms. So, the first uh, draft of the human genome was published in 2004, a project which was started in the in 1990. And today we can sequence a complete human geno genome in a few days. And since since the first human genome was published, um, there have been many many more organisms that have been sequenced. Um, and Ensemble was launched in 1999 with a goal to automatically annotate this first human genome draft to integrate it with other data and make it publicly available. Why do we need genome browsers, browsers like Ensemble? Um, with sequencing being more cost effective and faster, genomic data is piling up at a fast rate. Um, but when sequencing data is produced, you get something like this, which is just a bunch of letters without any meaning. So um, trying to read a genome without any annotation data would be like, um, like trying to read a foreign language without a dictionary, a, a language that you do not know. So it won't mean anything to you. And this is what genome browsers are there for. They're, um, they're there to, um, to understand the what the sequence is representing. And Ensemble is a type of genome browser. You can use genome browsers to map annotations to genomic data. And Ensemble brings together information from a wide range of other databases in a single site. Uh, you might have heard of UCSC and NCBI. Those are also genome browsers. Um, and I just want to say that um, Ensemble does not do uh, any of its own sequencing. 
we simply take publicly available sequencing data and use our own pipelines to annotate this data. Uh, there are many features that are in, annotated by Ensemble, which includes um, genes, variants, uh, promoters, binding sites, and many, many more. Genomes that are annotated with genes are referred to as gene builds. And um, we have variation data in a number of different species. Um, we also have comparative genomics data, such as alignments, gene trees, and homologs. And there is also a regulator, there are also regulatory builds available for human and mouse uh, from experimental data. Um, another thing you can do on Ensemble, um, you can, oh, sorry. You can uh, use different tools to export lar large amounts of data, for example, the Biomart, um, which we will be covering later today. And um, you can also process your own data using the variant uh, effect predictor uh, called ORVAP. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have time for this, but um, I will show you, I will direct you to some documentation pages where you can um, go through some online tutorials if you're interested. And um, finally, you can also access the Ensemble database programmatically via APIs. And the data on Ensemble is completely open source. And you can uh, retrieve whole genome files uh, direct, directly through our FTP sites. Um, the Ensemble browser is dedicated to vertebrate species specifically. Um, but as we know, vertebrate species are only a fraction of the different organisms that are present. Um, and you can find some non-vertebrate species on Ensemble, for example, fly, worm, and uh, yeast genomes, as these are more commonly used organisms. But if you are more interest, if you are interested in a very particular species, you can visit our sister site uh, it's called the ensemble genome browser and this is only de solely dedicated uh, to non-vertebrate species and they are divided into different ta taxa so we have um, an ensemble plant site uh, metazoa bacteria protists fungi and also a covid19 um, dedicated browser um, each taxon has different color codings, so you can see them at the top of these um, screenshots here. But uh, they are all structured in the, in the same way. So if you are familiar with uh, Ensemble, once you are familiar with Ensemble, um, you will be able to find data just the same way on Ensemble plants as you have found them on the Ensemble browser. Um, so because genomic data is constantly evolving and changing, Ensemble uh, update, is updated regularly every two to three months um, to represent the most recent genomic findings. And um, behind every update, there is a lot of work involved so that includes the addition of new genome assemblies, underlying software updates, uh, the up updates of gene sets. Um, oh my goodness. Sorry, my mouse is playing up today. Um, so we have, yeah, um, gene sets are updated. Um, new comparative genomics data is uploaded variation and regulation da data is updated, and um, sometimes uh, interfaces may be added or as well updated. Um, so the, the last release was Ensemble 105, sorry, um, which was published in December 2021. And currently, just a couple weeks ago, actually, um, the Ensemble 
the, the new Ensemble release was um, published, so Ensemble 106. Um, this would be Ensemble Genomes 53. So Ensemble Genomes was, um, was created a little bit later than the Ensemble browser itself. And you also uh, changed then some of the genes because we, uh, we had once that we found some uh, splice variants and then a few weeks later, one of them was gone in the list. Is that also what happened then with the updating? So um, this really depends on, <laughs> on the genes. So we have teams who do these um, annotation updates and this might, there might have been um, some published data that have um, that have a finding that um, didn't didn't coincide with the with the annotation before so that's why it might have changed and um, if that ever happens um, I, I'd say the best thing to do would be to uh, actually contact us through the help desk um, which email I'll give you later um, but this way I can we can look at the specific um, variant that you are interested in to s and ask the team members oh could you tell us what happened there so that would that would be the best option to do there because there there are a lot of different reasons why um, annotations might be changed or removed or added I hope that answered your question yeah, great, yeah, and like you say, um, Ensemble is constantly changing and it's not static. So when you do work um, on the Ensemble browser, you'll have to make sure you note down uh, what Ensemble version you are working with. So at the moment, it's 106. Um, if you're working with an older version, we also keep archives for up to five years um, that you can still use. So for example, for your um, for your research, you could, instead of using the current release, you could um, use the archives um, for the rest of your, of your analyses. Um, and I'll show you during the demonstration how to find out um, which release you're, uh, you're on and also where the archives are. So new genome assemblies are published all the time. And therefore, apart from Ensemble and Ensemble Genomes, we also have an Ensemble Rapid Release browser, which is updated every two weeks. And this browser includes genomes with gene annotations only. And the only tool that you can use on here is BLAST. Um, there is some comparative genomics data available, but that is gradually being updated. And just, yeah, just to note, there is no biomart or variation data available on, on the rapid release site. Okay, so uh, let's look at um, genome assemblies. The human reference <clears throat> Sorry, the human reference genome is not a genome of a single person, and it is not a consensus uh, genome either. It's made up of fragments of many different individuals. And each fragment um, represented here in blue um, represents a real person's genome, making the reference genome um, sort of like a mosaic or a hybrid genome of different individuals. And also note that genome assemblies um, are not a perfect representation of, of a species genome. There are still gaps in genome assemblies, but researchers are, co uh, are continuously filling these gaps, correcting errors and sharing patches. And this means that there can be ver different versions of a genome assembly. So for example, for human, um, we have three main versions, which uh, ensemble, um, which you can find on ensemble. Um, we've got the most recent GRCH38 or HG38 assembly, and it is 
also the most supported uh, human genome assembly on Ensemble. Uh, this has the fewest number of gaps and um, many rare alleles have been replaced with more common alleles. Um, uh, another version, another assembly of the gene of the human genome is the GRCH37 or HG19 assembly. Um, we have a site for this because it is still commonly used in clinical research. Um, it still it has some large gaps and um, updates are limited. Updates and um, yeah are limited on on this genome assembly. And finally, we also have um, an even older human assembly, which is the NCBI. 36 um, genome assembly, there are a lot more gaps on this, this assembly um, and it is no longer updated um, on Ensemble. So, oh sorry. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, exchanged uh, rare alleles with common alleles. Why, mm -hmm. why would you so um, this is done because um, common alleles are a better representation of uh, of a genome because um, alleles that are found more often in a population um, means it is a more consensus um, genome of that species. So if we had um, if we only added rare alleles to, for example, the human genome, it wouldn't be a representation of many individuals. It would be a representation of only a few individuals. And we want a genome that matches as many individuals as possible, if that makes sense. All right. You mentioned also that if you describe, for instance, a sequence, you always have to mention which genome assembly is being used because otherwise it doesn't match the numbers doesn't match that's also what we teach the, the third year students mm. because otherwise you can find it back in the in the sequence yeah yeah that's that's completely right um you have to mention which uh which exact assembly you're using and also often it helps which um to add which annotation pipeline was used to annotate that genome because um, I'm going to talk about it a bit more later, but um, Ensemble uh, has a different way of annotating genomes compared to uh, NCBI, for example. So there might be slight changes, differences, sorry. May I ask a other thing? Why are there differences? Why is there no so um, I I don't know the exact details of this. I can share a paper with you, but it's just different um, computational algorithm, algorithms that are being used that are preferred by Ensemble over NCBI, NCBI and the other way around. So it's just like how there are a lot of different ways of doing an alignment of a sequence. There are different algorithms that you can use to to create alignments. <laughs> I think we still don't know everything where it is. So you have to prove, I think, still that your gene is exactly as you expected. Yes, I, I, I get that. But it also makes it confusing in a way. Oh, yeah. Um, genomics is super confusing i completely agree because there, there are just so many tools that are out there that are being published all the time but this is what ensemble is really good in because ensemble has such a big team working on on um, annotating these genomes constantly being updated so it is quite reliable because we do um we do use um experimental biological data to support these annotations that 
that are being done. Um, okay, uh, so let's move on. Um, so just to summarize, uh, you can use Ensemble to explore uh, genomic regions. You can learn more about genes of interest and variants of interest. And you can also learn more about the genetic background of uh, phenotype. So this brings me to uh, the first demonstration, which is uh, we're going to look at the Ensemble home homepage and learn how uh, to find different information about species and genome assemblies. So I am going to open a new tab and type in ensemble.org. And this brings me to the homepage here. So here on the homepage, we have, <clears throat> sorry, we have the navigation bar on the top of the page. And <coughs> this has uh, links to different tools and sites. So if you click the Ensemble logo here on the top left, you'll just get sent back to the homepage where we are now. Um, we also have links to perform BLAST searches. You have a link to the Variant Effector Prediction tool, um, another link for a few other tools. We've got Biomart, um, we've got a link to the FTP sites, so where you can download whole genome sequences. And finally, there is also help and documentation that you can find under this link here. And if you uh, want to read more about news in Ensemble, um, we publish these in the blog. On the right hand side, um, we have description, a description of Ensemble. We've got the updates in the current release. Um, we've got a shortcut to the rapid release site and um, some posts from, from the blog. And if you're interested in, uh, uh, in the archive sites uh, of Ensemble, you can find that here at the bottom uh, right hand side of the page. So there is a link that says view and archive site. I'm going to open that. And this just gives you a list of the available archive sites at the moment. Um, on the left here, you can also uh, find some FAQs, um, a link to some tutorials. So for example, if you're interested in variants, which we won't be covering today, um, you can find that here. And also if you ever have a question, a particular question about um, a gene or a variant, you can contact the help desk and we will um, usually get back to you within a couple of days. So to get to get out of this um, archive pop up, um, I'm just going to click this uh, check mark on the top right hand side, or you can just click any empty, empty, um, empty space. And that just brings us back to the home page where we were before. Um, so scrolling up. We have two search bars. So we've got the search bar here in the middle of the page. This is uh, species specific. So here you'll have to select a species from the drop down menu and then enter your either uh, gene of interest, uh, coordinate, um, variant, or phenotype if you like. On here, you don't select a species at all. It's just searches for all species. So if you're interested in a uh, gene in all of the species, you can just type that out on the top right hand side uh, search bar. And if you are working with non-vertebrate genomes, you can go to the Ensemble genomes website. So either you open a new tab 
type in ensemblegenomes.org. Um, and this leads us to all the different uh, ensemble genome sites that we have. Um, I'm just going to go back to the Ensemble browser homepage. And I just wanted to show you as well, if you scroll to the very bottom, you can also find uh, those links to the Ensemble Genomes uh, sites at the bottom of the page here. Um, so if you would like, if you want to find out what uh, species we have on Ensemble, you can go down to this uh, species section here under the search bar and you can click on view full list of all species on the right hand side, uh, oh, sorry, on the left hand side here. And this just gives us a list of all the species that are available on Ensemble at this moment. So it is a very long list. If you are interested in a particular um, a particular animal, you can just type that in. For example, mouse gives you all the different mice. And um, you can also sorry, you can also choose to download the whole list. So there is this um, I, I Excel icon on the top right, which you can click. And you can uh, select to download either the whole table or whatever filter you just applied um, on on the table. And this will be a CSV file. So just I want to show you the species specific um, page as well. So in order to do that, I'm just going to yeah. use human as an example. So what I did was I type human here on the search bar of the list. Um, or I could have just searched for it myself, but it's much faster. And here um, you will see the human um, human assembly that is available on Ensemble. So this list just gives general information of the species. So we've got hum uh, the name, um, scientific name, taxon ID, um, the assembly that is available on this pay on this ensemble release, um, accession numbers, um, and also uh, if variation and regulation data is available for for the species. So for human, um, both variation and regulation data is available because of this Y for yes. Um, but for example, for hedgehog above human. Um, there is no variation or regulation data available. So I'm going to click on the human um, hyperlink. And this leads us to the species specific um, page. So here you can find um, you can find genome assembly information. Um, you can select different assemblies that are available. So we've got, for an Ensemble, we've got the GRCH37 and also the NCBI36. And in order to visit those pages, you just select um, it from the drop-down menu, and then you just click Go. And then you can, there is also an overview of um, all the different data available for this species. So we've got comparative genomics data, regulation data, here on the right, gene annotation, and variation data here. If you want to find out more about the, about the genome assembly itself, you can click on more information and statistics under the genome assembly section. So here on the left, and that opens up this page, which just gives you details on uh, the assembly, uh, the length when it was produced, um, patches that were made. You can um, 
read more about the gene annotation in this species particularly there is a um, each species, species species has a pdf file a pdf um, that just goes through the gene annotation process in more detail um, and then we also have some st summary statistics here on the right hand side so um, here's just some more information about the assembly itself who um, who the provider was <clears throat> the part the method of the annotation which i will go through a bit later today um, when it was last updated and also some uh, statistics statistics on the gene counts okay so this is um, just a little overview of Ensemble. I'm going back to the presentation as I'm finished with my demonstration now. And um, I'll give you some time to do the exercises. So if you go to the training page, which I still have open in this tab here, um, let me just paste the direct URL in the chat box so it's easy for you to find. Um, and the exercise we want to be doing now is the species and genome assemblies one. So feel free to go through the demo again if you like um, and choose which species you want to um, use to play around with on Ensemble. Um, I think 15, yeah, 15 minutes and then I'll move on to the next um, module. A lot of people use Ensemble. Um, it also might be that there are some tweaks in use it on the uh, uh, on your server uh, for getting all the information. Are there also specific um, well, let's, uh, additional sites uh, if, for instance, Ensemble works slowly? So in, in some other programs you have, the, then you can choose for the UK or the uh, USA or the Europe uh, version. Is there also some I'm um, sorry, do you mean the like mirror sites or do, can you just yes. rep Yeah, I, I mean mirror sites. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> sorry. We use the classes uh, with our students and when we have class and sometimes you don't get to the point because you cannot work fast enough or whatever. So yeah. are there any mirror sites for that? Yeah, um, let me show you where yeah. you can find these. So. I'm just going to go back to the Ensemble homepage and you can go to uh, help and docs here on the top. Mm -hmm. And then on the left, there is loads. There is a section of like all the different documentations we have, but we also have um, a section called mirror site. Uh, it's under about the Ensemble project. So I'm going to click that and these are the mirror sites that we have. So yeah, sometimes um, we have to change the, like move to a different mirror site because it's just too busy and then the server can be a bit slow when a lot of people are uh, working on it at the same time. Um, when you click on a mirror, uh, on the hyperlink, um, it opens a new page and then you, you'll see that you are on the mirror, indeed on a mirror site when there is like a little flag next to the ensemble logo on the top there. There is no direct link where you can start because you first have to enter this one to go via the helps and docs to the mirror site. Is there also? Um, I mean, you could. So there are three different mirror sites. You can um, just go directly to their um, yeah. URLs, yeah. which are uswest.ensemble.org, uh, useast.ensemble.org, and asia.ensemble.org. Okay. Uh, within, for your information, within our group, we have specialists on microbiology, on plants, and uh, on humans. So uh, everybody has his own uh, field of interest, as I would like to tell you. All that. So just, that's the reason why you get all kinds of different questions also. That, that's really great. Yeah, I like, I like it. <laughs> Um, oh, I think I forgot to mention, so um, as some of you are working with 
uh, non-vertebrate genomes. Um, I'm just going to open a new tab here and um, go to the Ensemble Genomes website. Um, so as I showed you earlier, these are the different um, Ensemble Genomes sites we have. But if you wanted to go to a particular um, uh, a particular ensemble genome site, you can actually just um, type in metazoa.ensemble.org or plants.ensemble.org. So you don't have to go through the ensemble genomes um, page all the time if, if you know um, which one you want to visit. Okay, um, so let's, oh, sorry, go on. Yeah, just yeah. one question on that. If you find, for instance, in, uh, with a, with a group of students in our work at Kukubita uh, Pepo as a plant, and, and there are some, uh, we find some uh, large genome sets. Um, how, what is the timeline when these sets are found before they enter ensemble, or do you, uh, are you allowed to make recommendations for that, or instance, if you work uh, for a long time on a certain species? Okay, we say, uh, can you add, please, this kind of information to ensemble? Is this logical or? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you ever, if there is ever a species that is not available in ensemble, you can always um, send us an email to the help desk and um, we can look into adding it to ensemble. So sometimes a species hasn't been added to ensemble if, um, if a genome assembly isn't of good quality. But um, yeah, as genomes are published all the time, this, this is a constant change. So two weeks ago, there might not have been a good uh, quality genome of, uh, I don't know, a mouse species. But now there is, uh, you can just message us and we will talk to the, to the teams and discuss if we can add it to the, to the database, uh, to Ensemble. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going to close the Ensemble Plants uh, tab and I'm going back to my presentation and I'm just going to move on to the next module. So here we're going to look at um, a specific region in the human genome on Ensemble. Um, there is no presentation for this, so it's just straight into a demonstration. So, and the demonstration uh, is um, looking at a region in the human genome, um, sorry, which I am going to paste into the chat box. So we're going to look at these coordinates on Ensemble and manipulate the view to see uh, what kind of data we can find. Um, so I'm going to open a new tab and go back to ensemble.org, leading us to the home page. And um, now what we can do is we can um, search for the coordinates either in this uh, search bar up on the top right, which will search for all species, or you can search in human alone by searching it on this search bar in the middle of the page. So I'm going to select the species from this drop down menu. And um, I've got human as a favorite here. So it's on the top for me. You can change uh, your favorite genomes by clicking on this little pen here. Um, but in order to do, to do that, um, you'll need to register. But um, this is this is free and um, you don't get spam or anything. It's just for um, to save certain uh, options or views or favorites um, so that you don't have to keep changing them all the time. Um, so now that we've selected human, I'm going to paste the coordinates into the search box. So this coordinate is structured um, in a way that it starts off with the chromosome number, um, followed by a colon, followed by 
the start um, start coordinate and a semicolon followed by the end coordinate. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Could you? Uh, so considering this uh, chromosome number, I know that at least because uh, I used to be working in plants and uh, in in Arabidopsis, and in, I noticed that I was when I was using biomarsh, for example, uh, that the chromosome numbers were indicated with just a number, while in terror it was with let's say chr and then the chromosome number so how do you yes again like there are some small little differences that are sometimes between uh gene genome annotations so how do you determine that number there or how you define that um oh <laughs> you got me there uh so i i'm not sure <laughs> um Alina, do you have any comments on that? Because, um, yeah, I'm not too familiar how these numbers are. Yeah, because like then, then the, the tool won't work as efficient, you know? So, mm. that's so on the main ensemble side, when you're using um, ensemble vertebrates, uh, you don't have to enter the CHR. Um, you, can only, um, you can just enter the chromosome number here. Um, and same goes for when we're doing, uh, for example, um, if you're using the VEP tool uh, where you uh, where we put in variants. Um, so if you're using the ensemble coordinates there, you don't have to use the um, CHR prefix. Um, so that's, this is just how, this is the ensemble default format. Um, sometimes if you are, um, if you are looking for, um, for example, if you have a different format and it says CHR or it's just written a bit differently, you can try searching for it in Ensemble. Sometimes it would match, uh, if you have the external references for it, it would just match the coordinates for you. Um, but this is how we would advise you to search for specific regions. Um, with obviously um, plant um, genomes, if you're on the Ensemble plants, um, website um, that might have different um, ways of um, putting in the coordinates, but then we would always give you an example of what the coordinates would look like. Yeah, and maybe I'm like, I'm now I'm thinking about it. I use, I use Biomart in, in R, so maybe that's what also part of it. It could be that, yeah. But if you use chromosome 4 with this region in your assembly uh, 38, P13, it will give you a completely different region than if you use the Yeah, yeah. So that's, so that's yeah, 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 I understand. Cool. Thank you, Alina, for uh, answering that. Um, okay, so if there are no other questions, I'm going to move on. Um, uh, like mentioned before, you start the coordinates with the chromosome, the start, and then the end code, um, end coordinate. So now I'm going to click on Go, which will open a new page, and this lands us on the location tab. So um, you can see which tab you're on by looking just underneath the human um, icon on the top left hand side here. Um, so more specifically, um, we are in the region in detail view. So here on the left, you can there are a lot of different location based uh, displays. So you can um, look at the whole genome, see the chromosome summary, um, look at the region overview, but as we are interested in region in detail at the moment, we're going to stay here. <coughs> and on the left, uh, sorry, on the right hand side, we have three different diagrams. So we've got this chromosome diagram, this region in detail diagram, and this even more detailed region 
here uh, further down. So on the chromosome diagram, the red box is the region that you have you have searched for, and um, on this um, on this section, you can see a different tracks. So these are um, the assemb assembly exceptions. These are called tracks, and they feature um, they represent features on on the sequence that you are looking at. So if you're interested in um, learning more about the track, you can click on, on, on it and you can select the different options here. For example, here on the eye icon is just more information. You can also choose to delete or highlight it. To get out of the pop-up, I'm just going to close it, click the X right there. Um, then moving down, um, we are in the region in detail view. So this is um, a view of your your region of interest in and its flanking sites. So it's a one megabase um, view of of the sequence. And here again, you can um, you see that it the location that you've selected is highlighted in a red box. You can um, change the option of your mouse. So if I click something here now, it just highlights a region. But if you wanted to, for example, um, scroll along the sequence, you can also click this uh, arrow here on the top right. And this allows you to drag the sequence to whatever location you want. Um, so similar to the chromosome um, display, you can see different tracks here. So um, we've got the chromosome band, which is this here on the top. We've got the contacts track so this is just the genome assembly track so you know which um, sequence you're on and um, then we've got a track of uh, of the different genes that lie in the sequence and you've also you've also got a track of um, the different regulatory uh, features that are um, available in this region Um, okay, so because I dragged <laughs> the sequence, um, it needs the the more detailed view needs an update. So I'm just going to click update this image. But actually, I just realized I moved it, so I'm going to reset the configure. Um, so yeah, reset the configuration so it goes back to the original um, location that I selected. This automatically loads um, the display underneath as well. So I'm just going to wait for that to load. Which might take some time. Is it these numbers are still not the same as you uh, typed in, in in the first instance? Sorry, can you repeat that, please? These numbers are still not the same as you typed in in your first instance. Yeah. A lot of zeros somewhere. Oh, um, let me just check then. Uh, ch -ch -ch. Ah, yes, you're right. I'm not in the correct location. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy the location again. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> uh, I have, I have something ah, here. Here. Yeah. Yeah. I see them then. I remember some pictures of that and then yeah, it's a burden. What is it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's yeah, that's an odd one. Hang on. Let me just search for this location again because I can see it's uh, completely you know, different there. Uh, Luis, can you also type in the in the, in the window that you had 
the numbers are presented somewhere halfway. Can you also there change the numbers and then immediately go to that? So you see here, if you scroll down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Here. There, in the location, can you also uh, copy there and then new numbers? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can pay. I could have pasted it in here. I don't know why I did the long way, <laughs> but yes, I could have just pasted it in here and it would have done the same thing. Um, okay, so now we're in, now that we are on the actual uh, location that we wanted, um, we can scroll down, which is just an even more detailed view of uh, the region that you are interested in. So here again, we have loads of different tracks. You can click on them um, to understand what they represent. You can also share um, share your current view with your colleagues by sharing this URL. You can also turn off tracks if you, for example, are not interested in, um, in regulatory uh, features, or you can choose to highlight it. Um, to get out of this pop-up, I'm just going to click outside in, on an empty pay, uh, empty area. Um, if you want to share the current image that you're seeing, you can do that here on the top, which says share this image. And again, it just gives you a link that you can share with your, with your collaborators or colleagues. Um, these tracks are also um movable so you can change the order of the different tracks by just dragging and dropping them um, okay so mm -mm, yeah so here similar to the region in view we have a context track followed by genes but in this display it is just in more detailed so we have the context track and genes on above the context track and below the context track so these are divided up into two um, parts because um, the genes that are represented above the context track are genes that are located um, on the forward strand and uh, genes um, that are displayed below the context track are genes that are dis that are um, that are located on the reverse strand so um, you can also if you I'm on the genes track here um, you can also see the direction of which strand it's on by looking at this greater than sign so greater than is on the forward and here, less than sign is on the reverse strand. Can you also change by picking the block to a set it to another position in your field to infer another view? But then, so the, the genes block, can I put it lower and higher? Yeah, uh, yeah. You can move that as well. You can change the, um, change the order of that. Um, also, um, you might see that there are a lot of different um, transcripts for a single gene. So here, for example, the FGF2 gene has three different, um, three different transcripts. Um, and uh, so the definition of gene on ensemble uh, is a collection of um, alternatively spliced transcripts. So one gene represents many transcripts. And this is just a, a graphical representation of this. So here again, you'll see loads of different transcripts of the same gene. And um, what are these open uh, squares? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, yeah, so the squares, they mean they are uh, different features of the transcript, which I'm actually going to cover again in the genes and transcript um, module. So, but if you, if you want to know more, like if you ever forget what the different um, graphics represent, 
there is a legend. Where is the legend? Hmm. Ah, yes. So you can you can click on the different um, on the actual feature and it says what it is. So here, gene type, protein coding, transcript type, it's nonsense, me nonsense mediated. But I'll I'll go through an overview of what the different like symbols mean um, in a minute. Okay, so um, now that you have an overview of the region in, in view um, page, I'll show you how to mm, configure or like manipulate this detailed view. So if you wanted to add tracks, for example, um, regulatory tracks, or uh, there are loads of different tracks I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, if you want to add tracks, you can either click on configure this image on the top left, or you can also scroll up and click on configure this page. This will um, open up a pop-up and these are all the different tracks that you can select from. And here on the right, um, you'll see the tracks that are currently active. So um, these are all default tracks. You can um, remove them by clicking on this little box on the left. And that just uh, disables a track. Um, so on the right, there are different categories of tracks. So that you've got um, tracks about sequence, assemb sequence and assemblies, genes and transcripts. Um, annotations such as protein alignments, variation, mutations, regulation. There are loads of different ones there. Um, but if you look at the number here on to the right of the categories, um, you'll just see how many tracks are available and how many tracks you have currently, uh, that are currently active. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add a track Let's see. Uh, let's add a clones and miscellaneous regions track. <coughs> Long reads track. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so you can select your different tracks here. And by clicking on this box, it uh, opens up different um, different ways to display the track. So you can um, choose to view uh, exon structure without uh, labels, with labels, expand, uh, collapse view. Um, but it's it's up to you how you want to um, how which type of view you want to select. So I'm just going to select a random one, and then I'm also going to select RNA seq models. So the RNA-seq models are taken from the human body map um, database and you can, oh, okay, this is a bit more complicated, but you can select the different um, gene models um, of these different tissues that are available. So let's just select this one. Um, so this saves automatically. Um, you can close the pop-up window by clicking on this top right icon on the check icon or again on an empty space and that updates the region and detail view which might take a little while again all right so the tracks that you have added are usually further down. Ah, here, sorry, there. Um, 
so here it was added um, just above the um, CCDS set. Um, so here is a long, long read sequencing track. Um, you can change this as well. You can change the order um, just like all the others. But um, the main reason why I wanted to show you this was to show you how to turn off a track. So if you click on this, uh, on the title, on the name, um, like, like so, um, you can find the information. But if you click on this X, it will turn off the track automatically. Um, so the view is also um, is also interactive. So you can't you can not just um, change the order of the of the tracks, but you can also click on the different features that you see on this track. So clicking on it just gives you more information of the particular um, the particular feature that you're looking at. So for example, if I click on this region, you'll see um, the gene information, but also links to, um, to the features. So you can find out more about, um, in this case, transcript in a new window in more detail. Um, okay, so this is the region in detail view. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. And I'm gonna give you some time to do the exercises. So in for this one, we're looking to answer the exploring genomic regions uh, exercises on the training page. So um, maybe, yeah, 20 minutes. 20 minutes and then we'll take a little break and then we'll go come back and um, do the genes and transcripts um, module. Okay, so it's 10 o'clock now. Um, if you're ready, I'd like to move on. Do you have any questions about the exercises? No, we, are, we, we had some uh, discussions just uh, uh, about how to apply these things in our own uh, school. So uh, nice to have. So you were just playing around with, with the different views, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, using the, the tutorials, but you can uh, then you also start thinking about how to uh, yeah, I, I always thought the best way to learn what Ensemble has to offer is to just, you know, click around and see what is there. Um, there is just so much information. It's a shame that um, we only have four hours. So, um, yeah, there's still so much more you can you could do on Ensemble. But yeah, like you say, you can go through the tutorials um, in your own time as well. But one question about downloading the. You know, yeah, well, how easy it is to do download multiple data sets? Just easily. You, you, you know, <coughs> Sorry, so you, you, want, you want to download what? Uh, download a lot of multiple data sets. Is that possible? Ah, yes. So if you want to download a lot of data sets, you can do that through Biomart, which um, Alina is going to talk about after this module. Um, so for Biomart, you don't need any programmatic uh, knowledge. It's just click and uh, click and base. Um, sorry, uh, clicking mouse clicking uh, version of uh, downloading data. Um, so yeah, Lena will will cover that um, afterwards. Um, okay, so I will uh, move on to the next module, which is genes and transcripts. And here I'll explain the gene view in more detail, how genes are annotated in Ensemble. Um, I'll talk about how transcripts 
um, and how to select, sorry, I'll talk about uh, transcripts and how to select uh, the best one. And we'll also go through the ensemble stable ID structure and um, the meaning of gene ontology on, on ensemble. And uh, finally, Alina will do a demonstration and you will also have time to do some more exercises. So as you've seen earlier, this is, this is the region in detail view. Here you can see the different transcripts of the gene. So um, remember on Ensemble, a gene is a collection of transcripts. So um, there are, there can be many alternative transcripts. Um, um, sorry, there, it's normal for uh, many alternative transcripts to be transcribed from a single uh, locus. So that's what you are seeing here, for example, for the MAG-T, um, MAG-T1 gene. And each transcript can be expressed differently and uh, serve a different function. And the different types of transcripts are colored, color coded in in, oh, there it is, in blue, red, gold, and gray. So I've just added a little uh, diagram here on the right. Um, so we have protein coding genes, which are transcripts that are translated and produce proteins. So these are colored in red. Um, we also have protein coding genes, mm, sorry, we also have protein coding genes that are non-coding transcripts and are not translated. So for example, uh, retained intron transcript or nonsense mediated decay. So these can be fragmented and um, maybe missing a translation site um, are faulty degra or degraded before they could be translated. These are colored in blue. We also have non-coding genes, which do not produce proteins. For example, RNA genes, these, color, these are colored in gray. So here you can see these two examples. It's a bit, it's a cut off. So you don't really, you don't actually see the sequence, but you see the name, the gene, uh, the transcript names there. And uh, we also have the golden or merged transcript. So that's the golden color here. And um, this represents transcripts with high, high confidence in the annotation. So these golden transcripts can be both coding and non-coding. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, golden transcripts um, in a later slide. So uh, let's look at the different, um, the different features that you can see here. Um, so we have these lines and we also have these boxes as you have um, pointed out earlier and um, so the boxes represent exons in the sequence and the lines represent introns in the sequence and there are two types of uh, exons and two types of introns so um, these are labeled here so if you see a box that is empty like this one right here um, on the left um, this represents a non-coding exon. And um, if you see a box that is filled with a color, for example, here on the right-hand side, this represents a coding exon. And for the introns, um, uh, for the introns, you have uh, two different shapes. So um, you might not be able to see it very clearly here. It's quite small, but um, if you look closely, it's sort of a V shape, like a valley shape, and that represents an intron on the reverse strand. So earlier during the um, region in detail view, um, I told you that genes above the assembly um, track, the contact track, are on the forward strand, and genes below the contact track are on the reverse strand. So here it just, if, if you moved around the tracks, um, you can make sure that it indeed is, an intron is on the reverse strand by looking at the shape of the line. 
So V is for reverse strand. And then here on the right, we have um, an intron shaped like a, like a hill. Um, and this represents introns on forward strands. These are these, these parts of the sequence that you see. Are these proven to be non susmediated decay or proven to give rise to protein, or are they predicted to give rise to protein? So, yeah, if you want to find out more about a particular uh, feature, you can actually click on. Um, on the on the features here, so um, Alina will go through um, how to view more details on certain features and how to find out more information on them during the demonstration. But uh, yes, you can you, you've, you that information is available. And um, yeah, if you ever forget what the color codes stand for, you can always um, check the documentation on Ensemble. Um, so in Ensemble, we have two independent annotation methods. Uh, both rely on valid biological experimental data. And we have the automatic annotation which is done by Ensemble. And we also have the Havana manual annotation. Um, and this is done by a group of um, annotators, so people. Um, the Havana annotation is only applied to human, mouse, and um, partially, sorry, human, mouse, <laughs> and partially zebrafish and rat. And the automatic annotation is um, applied to all vertebrates uh, in the Ensemble browser. The automatic annotation method is a gene prediction pipeline, and it is based on real biological experimental data. And we take known data, for example, transcripts, uh, proteins, cDNA, RNA-seq, um, which are then mapped to the genome um, by different tools, uh, computational tools. Um, and on, some, on ensemble, uh, gene annotation is only mapped when there is experimental evidence that a gene is transcribed. Um, for the automatic annotation, it can take up to two weeks to annotate, annotate a single genome. Um, in comparison to the manual, to the Havana manual annotation, a single genome can take several years because this is done by a, a person. Sorry. Um, this is a list of the annotation sources that are used in the ensemble annotation pipelines. So we've got here um, for the automatic annotation, we retrieved nucleotide data um, that was submitted to the international, oh, sorry, international nucleotide sequencing database collection, INSDC. Um, and this is a collaboration of um, three databases, the European Nucleotide Archive, ENA, uh, NCBI's GenBank, and the DNA Data Bank of Japan, the DDBJ. And yeah, so here we uh, collect data such as C cDNA, RNA-seq, and um, proteomics data is retrieved from SwissProt and Tremble. Um, if there is not enough experimental data available, for example, for a lesser studied organisms. Um, Ensemble also performs annotations based on the on gene predictions by sequence similarity of a more closely related, better studied organism. And in the manual gene annotation pipeline, the annotation is done um, by a person on a, on a case by case basis. <clears throat> 
by looking at specific data such as RNA-seq and transcript structure that has been published. So um, there is a much wider range of evidence an annotator can retrieve data from because um, the person can just read this data. Whereas in the automatic annotation, it is retrieved computationally from databases. Um, and as you might have guessed, the manual annotation process is much more laborious as um, the human annotator moves along the gene to map published ex experimental data um, using different um, databases and um, publications. Uh, this can take, it can take up to half a day to annotate a single gene using the manual annotation method. Um, however, it is more accurate um, for difficult features such as UTR, splice sites, um, single exon transcripts. Um, and because it is taking much more time, um, it is only done for human and mouse and partially for zebrafish and rat. Um, so now that you know about the ensemble annotation methods, um, if you remember from the first slide, I mentioned something about golden transcripts. So a golden transcript is, is just a transcript that has been annotated identically by both the, autom um, the ensemble automatic annotation and the manual Havana annotation. Um, so this means that uh, the features of this transcript was, I was annotated identically, the same in both methods, the same location, uh, same intro and exon set, same length. Um, so that means that there is a higher confidence in the function and quality of the transcript. That's why it's colored in gold. There is also the uh, GenCode project, which centers around the ensemble human and mouse gene sets. Um, it is a merged gene set of the ensemble automatically annotated and the Havana manually annotated genes in human and mouse. And it is um, the default gene set used by many um, international projects, such as NOMAD, uh, 100,000 Genomes Project by Genomics England, 1,000 Genomes Project, and so on. And elaborating on transcripts, um, I just want to introduce you to canonical transcripts. So this is a flag that is available on Ensemble. And this, a canonical, a canonical transcript is just a single representative transcript that is identified at every locus in every species. So um, these are transcripts that are most highly <clears throat> conserved and expressed um, in concordant with other transcript scoring algorithms, such as APRI and uh, Uniprot canonical isoforms. And it is, um, and they also have the longest uh, coding sequence and the long largest number of clinically important variants. Uh, another project um, that's important to know about that Alina mentioned earlier is the main select project. So MAIN stands for Matched Annotation from the NCBI and EBI. So um, it is another measure of the quality of a transcript. And um, NCBI has its own gene annotation pipeline and gene set, uh, which is called RefSeq. So um, MAIN select transcripts are um, transcripts that are identical in both RefSeq and Ensemble. So they have 100% identical uh, annotations. Uh, the main select transcript is agreed to be the most biologically relevant and representative for a gene. 
Um, so looking at ensemble uh, stable IDs, um, all features on ensemble, so genes, transcripts, proteins, exons, have uh, an ensemble stable ID assigned. So this is composed of an ENS um, prefix, a single letter representing the feature type. So we've got gene, transcript, exon, peptide. And this is followed by an 11 digit number and a version number after the dot. Um, stable IDs do not change during um, between releases. But if there is a small change during, um, if there is a small change in the annotation, a different version is just added. So it would be NG number, 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 dot two or whatever um, the next version would be. Um, for a non-human species, a suffix is added uh, after the ENS prefix. So for example, for mouse, um, it would be ENS, MUS for mus musulus, G for gene or T for transcript and so on, following the same pattern. And then again, a number. And finally, I want to make you, I want to talk to you about um, gene ontology terms or GO terms. And uh, just like any language, there can be multiple terms for a uh, same biological function of a gene. So for example, one person might call it innate immunity, while another person would call it non-specific immunity. And to tackle this, um, scientists have um, created a more standardized way of describing functions. So the scientific community came up with GO terms to make sure that we are indeed talking about the same function. And um, geo terms are also meant to be more easily searchable as they have unique accession numbers, uh, name, type, and definition. Uh, these gene ontology terms are structured in a hierarchy. So um, each box represent, represents a G, geo term, go term, sorry. Um, or geo, whichever you want. Um, and it can have a parent term, which describes the wider function of the feature. Um, but it can also have daughter terms, uh, sorry, child terms, which uh, describe a more detailed function. Um, and yeah, again, each, each go term has um, its unique ID, a name, type, and definition. Um, and if you're looking for function, a function in Ensemble, you would usually um, refer to the go term of, of a transcript. Um, the Ensemble gene annotation system is very complicated, um, but if you are interested in learning more about the computational side of it, and also just uh, lear learn more information about the two different types, um, you can read this publication. Um, okay, so I'm, we are at the demonstration now. I'm going to hand over to Alina if she is ready. Um, do you guys have any questions in the meantime? Cool. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Louise. And there you go. No worries. Thanks. Okay, so my name is Alina Mishtak, and I am um, also part of the outreach team in Ensemble with Louise and Ben. And I'm going to be talking about the demonstration for genes and transcripts. So we're going to look at the UQCRQ human gene, and we're going to try and find out more information about this gene and its transcripts. And then later on, uh, we will have some time um, for some exercises. And then after that, we'll come back and I will be speaking to you about 
Biomart, which is this really cool data export tool, um, as Louise said, that you can use to export large data tables in Ansible. So let me just um, share my screen with you. Please bear with me. And we will go through the demo now. Can you see my screen okay? Okay, thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are interested in the UQCRQ human gene. So I'll just type the name of this gene on the um, Zoom chat as well. It's UQCRQ. So we're on the home page. And from here, I'm going to choose this center search section. And from here, I'm going to choose human. Um, and I'm now going to type in my gene name. Um, so it's important that you select the species here because gene names are ambiguous. So we can have UQCRQ, for example, in mice or rat or other species. Uh, but if you want your results specific to human, uh, then I would encourage you to choose human from this drop down menu. Similarly, you can also, if you want, just type human um, in the search um, text box that's provided. And then this is followed by a colon. And then if it's um, if you provide your gene name, then it will also give you search results for human only. So I'm just going to delete this for now because I've already specified from the drop down menu and I'm now going to click on go. We have our search results here, um, and I'm going to click on the first search result, which is the UQCRQ human gene. And this takes me to the gene tab. So this tab collects information on genes. And here we have the gene tab open and you'll notice that next to it, we automatically get the location tab as well. So if you want, you can toggle between the two tabs. So this gene tab that we're on, uh, we have this page specific menu on the left-hand side. So we have these gene-based displays. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have these uh, blue buttons that allow you to configure this page. Um, custom, you can add custom tracks, export data, share this page and so on. On the main view, we have a little um, overview. So we have the gene name, which is UQCRQ, followed by its ensemble stable ID. We have the full description of the gene. We have the gene synonyms. And then we also have the location. So this gene is located on chromosome five. We have the coordinates. We have information about the strand orientation. So it's on the forward strand. And we also have information on the assembly. So it's on GRCH 38. And then we have some more information about this gene. So this gene has six transcripts, um, 207 orthologs, and it's associated with three phenotypes. We also have this button that says show transcript table. And if I click on this, it's now going to show me a table. So which has all the six transcripts of this gene. So in this table, we first have the transcript ID. We have the transcript name. We have the length of the transcript, the amino acid length, the biotype. So whether it's protein coding or if it's a retained intron, Anything in Ensemble that has this dotted underline, if you just hover over it, um, if you hover over that text, um, you will have this pop-up um, sort of description open up that gives you more information about it. We have in the next column, the CCDS match, the Uniprod match, and also the RefSeq match if available for the transcripts. 
in the last column, we have these flags. So uh, Louise has spoken about uh, the flags. Um, so for example, this first class clip has the main select. Um, so we also give you information on what the main select means. Uh, it also has the ensemble canonical flag and also some more as well. So this is the most representative transcript of this gene. And um, further on, if I, I'm just going to hide this transcript table for now, just to make the view a bit more clearer. Um, so further on, we have the summary for this gene. Again, we have the CCDS um, information. We have the Uniprot match. So we have, we'll link you out to Uniprot as well. If you just click on this ID, uh, we have information on the RefSeq match. Um, and then we also have information on the gene type. So it's a protein coding gene and also the annotation method. So this um, gene, um, the annotation for this gene includes both automatic annotation from Ensemble and also the Havana manual annotation, both of which Louise has spoken about in her presentation. If I scroll further down, we then also have a nice graphical representation um, of this um, gene. So we have all of its transcripts in the location context. What I'm going to do now is that I'm going to focus on the left-hand side. So this gene-based display menu. And from here, I'm going to explore sequence. So I'm going to click on sequence on the left-hand side in the gene-based displays menu. So in this view, um, mm -hmm. this page shows you the sequence of our gene of interest. And then we also have its flagging region. And then we have, um, I would like you to point you out to this page specific help. So on most of the ensemble pages, you will see this question mark icon. And if we click on this question mark, it's going to open the page specific help. So it's going to tell you uh, what the different coloration and the decoration means on the page and what you can do with the different buttons. So over here, you'll notice we also have a nice um, video tutorial that's related to this page. Um, on the left-hand side, um, on this help page, we also have links for the frequently asked questions, some video tutorials, glossary, and also a link to contact help desk. So this will then put, it, uh, put you in touch with us if you have any specific queries regarding your research. So I'm just going to jump out of this page and go back to the sequence view. So over here, we have our sequence. Um, so we have these buttons first. So you have the option to download the sequence. So if I just click on this, um, we then have the option um, to choose the file format. So you can choose from FASTA or RTF, which is the rich text format, which is going to give you a static image um, and you can see your image with um, colorations and decorations and this can be opened in a word processor. And then you can select the type of sequence that you want to export. So this is um, selected by default on genomic sequence but if you want you can export just exons, amino acid sequence, coding sequence or also the cDNA. Um, you can also choose the five prime and the three prime flagging size. And then we have these guides over here um, that show you what your faster format would look like or what the RTF would look like. I'm not going to download anything for now, but I just wanted to show you the different options that you have. So I'm going to close this. Um, so I can close, I can go back to my original page either by clicking on this tick button over here um, which will save and close, or I can click on anywhere outside of this menu, and this will take me back to the original page. Um, we then have this button that says blast the sequence. So you can, if you want, blast the entire sequence, or alternatively, if I go to this sequence um, letters over here, and then I click and drag my mouse, you also have the option to blast a selection. Um, so if I just um, choose this again, and then we can click on blast selected sequence. 
Um, underneath these blue buttons, we then have a legend. Um, so you have the um, exons here that are shown. So in this brown lettering. So the exons, um, so, and then there's this next thing that says all exons in this region. So what this means is that exons are highlighted in this peach coloring that you see on the, on the sequence. However, the exons of our gene of interest are indicated by this brownish lettering. So these exons with these brown, let, uh, sorry, these black letters, these are basically the exons of a neighboring gene which also overlaps this region. I hope that this makes um, sense. Um, then we also have the option to manipulate this view. So on the left-hand side, if I go to configure this page, so it's this blue button, I can then customize what I see. So we have these different display options. So we can choose the five prime or the three prime um, flanking size. So this is set to 100, but if you want, you can, um, for example, um, decrease it so I can choose 50. Um, and then also for the three prime, I'll choose 50. Um, you can also choose to number um, base pairs per row. Um, we can have um, the um, option to show variance, for example. So over here, we have this line that says show variance. This is selected to no, but if you want, you can select it to yes. And then this is going to display all of the variants that fall within your region of interest. Um, so I will select this as yes, because I want to show you this option. And then we have some further configurations that you can choose. Um, so you can filter your variants by different consequence types or evidence status. So once you're happy with the configurations that you've chosen, you can simply save and close this menu by clicking on this tick in the corner. So it's on the right hand side. So I'm just going to wait for this to load. Okay, so our there our sequence has now loaded and you can see it's quite a colorful um, image now. And this is because we have marked up all of the variants that fall within this region. And you can find what these different colorations mean. So for example, um, where I'm pointing, this is um, sort of in this yellow coloring. So if we just click on this, so if I click on this um, code, it's then going to give me more information about this variant. So we have the classification of the variant, the source that this variant was imported from. So it was imported from dbSNP, the alleles associated with it, and then also the consequences associated with it. So I'm going to close this for now. Um, and overall, um, you can see that this is a faster sequence. So I'm do apologize, it's a bit messy right now, but if you just, if I just point you out to this first line over here, this header, so we know that this is a faster sequence because it starts with this greater than sign, and then we have information on the chromosome and the assembly and the start position, the end position, and this one over here indicates that this is a forward strand. And if it, if it was minus one, then it would indicate that it's a reverse strand. All right, so the next thing now that we're going to talk about is the gene ontologies. So also on the left-hand side, we have this section that says ontologies and we have uh, biological processes, we have molecular function, and we also have cellular component. I'm going to click on biological process. So on the left-hand side in the ontologies section, and this table is going to summarize the different ontology terms that are associated with this gene. 
So we have over here the gene ontology accession numbers, we have the term, we have the evidence, the annotation source, and then we also have the transcript IDs associated. So over here in this column, we have the transcript IDs, but not the gene IDs. And this is because the gene ontology terms are associated with the transcript or proteins. And in this particular instance, the table is not very large, but it can get super massive. Um, and this is why we also have the option to filter your table. So we can filter by entering. So this filter option is available on the right-hand side at the top of the table. So you can filter by, um, if you know the accession number, the gene ontology term, the transcript that you're interested in. And then you also have the option to export this table by clicking on this Excel icon. Um, another thing that I want to show you is the external references that we have. So also on the left-hand side, we have this link over here that says external references. So let's go to the external references now. And this page links you out to other databases and resources, which also have some information on. Um, so we have information over here, for example, from Expression Atlas, uh, we have the NCBI match, um, we have Reactome gene, Vicky gene, and then we also have the uh, database identifiers that correspond to the transcripts of this gene mentioned here. Um, so this is everything that I wanted to show you on the gene tab. As you can see, uh, we don't have enough time today to go through everything, but Again, on the left-hand side, you, you'll notice that we have this section over here for comparative genomics. So you can um, see the orthologs um, and the gene tree associated with this gene. We have uh, this phenotype um, um, section over here as well. And then we also have a section for genetic variation where you can go to a variant table that will give you a table that shows you all of the uh, variants that fall within this gene, variant image, and also information on structural variants. But now we're going to move on to explore the transcripts of the um, gene further. So I'm going to click on this blue button again that says show, show transcript table. And we have our table here that shows all of the transcripts. And I'm going to click on this first transcript ID. So this is the most representative transcript, and we know that because it has the main select flag, and it also is the ensemble canonical transcript. So we hide this table for now, and we are now on the transcript tab. So this has opened next to the gene tab. So we have information here about the um, transcript table ID, the transcript name, Again, we have the overview, so the description, location, and then we have this little summary for this transcript. So we have um, the summary statistics. So you can see we have this graphical representation. Um, you can see how many exons it's got. So it says that we have got three exons, and these are also shown in this diagram above. Um, two of them are coding, so that's true. We have these two boxes that are filled. Um, we have the transcript length information and also the translation length. Um, so what I want to do here is that I want to explore some transcript based displays with you. So on the left hand side, um, we have this um, sequence section over here. And from here, you can choose to display sequences of exons of cDNA or protein as well. So I'm going to click on exon sequences. So on the left-hand side, under sequences, I'm going to click on exons. And here we have a table summarizing all the exons in this transcript. So you can find the exon racking transcript, um, 
we have the exon stable ID, we have the start and the end position, the start phase, end phase, we have the length, and then we also have the sequence. Um, at the top of this table, we have this legend that explains what the different um, colors of um, what the different yeah, colors of the letters mean. So blue is the translated sequence. Um, then we have the flagging sequence in green, and then intron sequence is shown in gray, uh, in gray, and then UTRs are shown in this orange coloring. You can further manipulate this view. Um, so again, we can go to configure this page on the left-hand side. And from here, we can choose the different display options. So we can choose the flagging sequence at either end of the transcript. Um, so this is set to 50, but let's have it longer. Let's set it to 100. And um, we can choose the number of uh, base pairs um, per row. Um, we can choose to show full intronic sequence if you want. So I think I clicked on this accidentally, uh, but I'm going to remove this for now. Um, you can also choose to show exons only in your sequence. We can show line numbering, um, uh, variants, and so on. So I've only changed the flagging sequence, and now I'm going to save and close this menu. So we have our um, table over here again, and you'll notice that the flagging sequence, I think, is a little bit larger than what it was before. The next thing that we're going to explore is the cDNA sequence. So again, I'm going to go back to the left-hand side menu, and under sequences, I'm now going to click on cDNA. With all of these sequences that I'm showing you, you will always have the option to download the sequence. So we have the cDNA sequence here. We have the buttons for download, downloading the sequence. Um, you can also blast the sequence. And this, um, so this is the sequence of the mature spliced transcript. And this view is composed of three rows. So you'll notice that this first row um, is our actual cDNA. So this is the spliced transcript with the UTRs that's indicated by this yellow highlighting. And you'll notice that this starts from with A, so A is over here, and then we have T and G. Then the second row is the coding sequence, so CDS, and it also starts with ATG, so A is here, and then you'll notice that TG is over here in the second line. And then the third row is actually our protein sequence. So you'll notice that over here, it starts with a methionine. Um, the exons are shown in, the alternative exons are shown in black or blue letterings, just to show you the exon boundaries. Um, and the alternative codons are shown in this, um, yellow light yellow highlighting or the lack of. Um, I know there is a lot going on on this view, but you can find out more information about it by clicking on this question mark icon um, on this page. And if I just click on this, this is now going to open a help page that will then show you what the different line numbering means, what the different sequence coloration means. So you can always refer to this if you're not sure. Um, about something on the page. Okay, I'm going to close this and go back to my transcript tab. Um, the other thing that I want to show you is the um, protein information that we have in Ensemble. So proteins are not features in Ensemble. So they don't have a dedicated tab as they do not map to the genome directly. They map to the genome via transcripts. So this is why we do have some protein information on the transcript tab. So on the left-hand side, under protein information, you'll see we have protein summary, we have domains and features, variants, PTB 3D protein model, and then we also have some really exciting stuff from AlphaFold. So this is the 3D structure predicted by AlphaFold. So I'm going to 
um, click on protein summary on the left hand side. And here we have the um, graphical representation um, of this translation. So here we have the N terminus, um, and then we have the C terminus um, of this translation. And this is colored to show you the exon boundary. So you can see that this pink color is the first exon, and then we have this purple color that indicates the next, so the second exon. We then have some protein um, domains predicted by different methods. Um, so uh, we have PFAM, Panther, Gene3D, and then we also have information on the sequence variants. Um, and then we have a nice legend uh, that shows you what all of the different colorations on this image would mean. If you're not a fan of graphical representations, we also show all of this information in a table format. So on the left-hand side, if I click on domains and features, you will then find a list of predicted protein domains in a table. So you can find the domain source, the start and end, the description, the accession number, um, and also hyperlinks to external sources. And then the last thing that I want to show you is the 3D protein model. So I'm going to click on this PDB 3D protein model on the left-hand side. So we input 3D protein models from PDBE, um, and we have this really nice interactive widget over here, which shows you our protein and its 3D structure. You can manipulate this view. You can rotate this protein if you want. And um, so the customizable options um, have now appeared sort of like at the bottom of the page. And this is because I'm zoomed in, but I'm just going to zoom out of this page a bit. So you'll notice that now I have these options, these configurations on right hand side. So from here, you can choose um, to show the exons um, within this uh, protein. So if I just click on this eye, it's then going to highlight the exons for you. We can choose to show more protein information and also variant information as well. So this is everything that I wanted to show you on the um, gene and the transcript tab. And we now have time for the exercises. So we're now going to go back to the training page uh, for Evans Hall School, and we're going to do the exercises that are mentioned in the genes and transcripts tab. So again, as Luis has mentioned before, we have this tab for demo. So this is basically going to show you screenshots that are nicely annotated. So pretty much everything that I've covered. So you do have the option to just go back to the different pages um, if you would like a little recap. And then underneath the demonstrations, we also have these genes and transcripts exercises. So we have quite a few exercises over here and all of them are a bit large, so they can take a bit of time, but please remember, you don't have to do all of them. Just try the ones that are most, um, that are of most interest to you. And um, I think we'll give about 20 minutes uh, for these exercises, and then we'll come back and I will speak to you about Biomart. Right, how are we doing with the exercises? Are there any questions? I couldn't get the I couldn't get the PT the the great one to work. Sorry, I didn't understand that. There's a great exercise. Yeah. I, that one didn't work for me, but the others work. Okay. Um I think potentially it was updated. <laughs> do you mean it didn't work as in like the answer you couldn't get to the answers or um yeah. the page didn't load i couldn't get me the answers okay um there are always these text answers and also we have the video answers if you get stuck anywhere um and if you are still having issues with them, uh, please do just um, 
um, just write down the issue or share the screenshot on the living document and I'll be happy to get back to you um, after this course. I am aware that we are running out of time a little bit and we still have to cover the Biomark module. So I'm just going to move on to that if that's okay. Um, All right. So we're now going to talk about Biomart, which is this really cool, as I mentioned, data export tool from Ensemble. And it allows you, so it's highly customizable, and it allows you to export large amounts of Ensemble data tables uh, without any programming knowledge. So without any programming skills, all you have to do is build queries with a few mouse clicks, and you can generate custom data tables and also sequence files. So Biomod is great for things that could be time consuming, difficult, and tedious. So if you wanted to download, for example, just a sequence of hundreds of genes or a genomic location of hundreds of variants, doing it one by one would take you a very long time, and it would also require you to hop from one ensemble tab to another. But in Biomart, you will be able to do it more efficiently and faster in just one place. So I've used this analogy over here of a supermarket. So it's a bit like, um, you know, the different um, shops. So like the um, place for bread, so bakery, cheese, and vegetables all coming together in just one supermarket. Um, so it's great for things like ID conversions. Um, as researchers, you often end up working with different databases. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, um, we had this um, discussion about NCBI, Ensemble, UCSC. So if you're working with these different databases, then you would need to convert IDs. Um, so because all of them have their own identification systems. So Biomart can convert these for you. Biomart can export large amounts of data, but it has limited capacity. So it's not a whole genome data export. If you want whole genome files, um, please refer to our FTP site. Um, if you asked Biomart to get the output for all possible human genes, it's going to crash. So we would suggest doing around 500 items of one at once. So you can always divide your queries if you want in 500 at each time. And you can find Biomart on the blue navigation bar at the top of the Ensemble Vertebrates page. And then it's, um, it's a different color uh, for Ensemble genomes, depending on the taxa. So I've used the example over here for Ensemble plants. And then, um, Biomart is available for um, all taxa divisions apart from bacteria, as there are just too many of them. And to use Biomart, you'll have to follow four simple steps. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to choose your database and species of interest. You will then need to narrow down this uh, big database of all possible genes to a smaller data set of interest and you will do so by applying filters. Then in the third step, you will need to choose your attributes. So these are things that you want to print in your output. And then the final step is you have the option to view your results and you also get the option to export them in different formats. So let's look into, into the first step in detail. So the first thing that you have to do is that you have to define your data set. So you can choose different databases depending on what you're curing for. So you can look for databases in ensemble genes. We have variation data, regulation. There's also mouse traits, but you're likely not to use this option unless you're looking for specific differences between the different mouse strains. Um, then you can use the mouse strains option. Um, and then after you've chosen your database, you will then need to define your species of interest. In the second step, uh, you will have to apply filters. So these are things that you want to search with. Most of the time we are interested in a subset of genes that match certain names or are associated with a given phenotype or function or that fall in a specific region. 
and Biomart gives you a lot of flexibility. So you can apply just one filter and build a simple query, or you can apply multiple filters and build a more complicated query. So it follows and logic. Uh, so it gives you intersectional filters. So for example, let's say that I'm interested in all genes in chromosome nine. And then the second filter is that I want all genes. Um, I want so genes that have the transmembrane domain. So in this case, Biomart will give me the output. Uh, so it will give me the transmembrane domain genes on chromosome nine as the output. If you don't get any results, then this probably means that there was no overlap between your filters. Then you need to specify your attributes. So this is the third step. So this is what you want in your output table. And we provide a wide selection of these, including IDs, features, variants, homologs. So these are orthologs and paralogs and sequences. And finally, you can export your data. So Biomart supports several file formats, including HTML, um, comma separated, uh, tab separated, XLS. With XLS, please bear in mind that sometimes Excel tables would automatically change certain gene names into dates. So just be careful with that. Um, for example, if you have a gene called Oct2, Excel might change it, change it to October the 2nd. Um, you can also export your sequences in the FASTA format. If you are an R user, uh, there is also an R package available for Biomart, and you can find more information about this by um, going to the links um, on my slide. And you can find more information about the Biomart resources on these publications. So now we're going to move on to the demonstration. So what we're going to do is that we're going to look at six human genes. So these are the genes. We have the gene names for them. And from this information, we're going to find out the matching NCBI IDs, the gene ontology terms, so the functions, and we also want the cDNA sequences. So I'm going to jump out of my presentation and I'm going to go to the Ensemble Genome Browser. So as I mentioned, you can find Biomart on the blue navigation bar at the top of the page. And I'm going to follow my first step, which is to choose the database. So we are interested in Ensemble Genes. So I'm going to select Ensemble Genes. 106 just means the version number. So we are on um, the release number, which is um, 106. So I'm going to select Ensemble Genes, and now I'm going to choose my data set. So I'm going to choose human genes as this is what the exercise has asked for. And this is loading, but you'll notice that once I've selected my data set, on the left-hand side, the option of filters is going to become available. So I'm going to select filters, and you'll see we have these different filters over here. So we have region, gene, phenotype, gene ontology, multi-species comparisons. You can also filter by protein domains and families data. And you also have the option to filter for genes associated with variants. So as an example, if I expand this region tab by clicking on this plus, um, you have the option to filter by chromosome. So to activate this filter, I'm going to click on this box next to chromosome. And let's say that I want to filter the human genes that fall on chromosome nine. So I'm going to select nine from this list. And you'll notice that um, the filter is also going to become available on the left hand side under the filters section. So I've chosen chromosome nine as a filter over here. But we're not interested in filtering the human genes by chromosome or region. So I'm going to remove this um, filter by clicking on this box again. But I just wanted to show you uh, that this is an option. We also have the option to filter by specific coordinates, karyotype bands, uh, multiple regions. And then we also have this 
next tab that says gene. So you can filter here by different gene information so you can limit, so you can input external references, um, so you can provide their IDs and then filter by that to get your output matching to the IDs that you've provided. And this is what we are going to do in a minute. But I also wanted to show you that you can limit to genes by microarray probes and probe sets. You can input microarray probes and probe sets. You can filter by gene type. So it could be pseudogenes, protein coding genes, and so on, transcript type, and various other um, filter options are available. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to scroll up and I'm going to choose this option that says input external reference ID list. So I'm going to click on this and I'm going to um, go back to my presentation and actually copy these gene names from here. And then go back to Biomart. And from this drop down menu in the um, input external reference ID, this is set to gene stable ID, but we actually have gene names. So I'm going to select gene names. And now I'm going to input my, I'm going to paste in my gene names here. So as I mentioned, it could be comma separate. So you can provide the list here as a comma separated, tab separated, as a list, or you can also choose a file from your computer. So I've provided my gene names. I've chosen the appropriate external reference ID. Um, and now I'm going to click on count. So on the left hand side, we have this um, button over here that says count. And what this will um, show us is that it will just give us a number. So a count for the query with any filters applied. So this is what I'm going to click on. And it shows us that six out of 68,000 genes match our filters, which is true because we've provided six gene names. Next thing, so the third step is the attributes. So now I'm going to choose what I want to display in my output table. And we have different options over here. So we have different categories. We have features, attributes, we have structures. Uh, so you can get details on genomic structures. We can get uh, options uh, for homologs that match our um, input variants, germline and somatic, and also sequences. We can only choose one category at a time. So I'm going to stay with features. So these are the general gene features. And over here we have, um, we can choose for different attributes in the gene section. Um, so we can choose to display in our table, the gene stable ID that matches our gene name, the transcript stable ID that matches our gene name. Um, I'm going to remove gene ID version because we don't need this. Um, I'm also going to select gene name um, because it's always best to match your output to your input. So we will have the gene names in our table as well. And we, the exercise asked for gene ontologies. Um, so I'm going to click on this external tab. Um, and from here, I can choose to also include gene ontology term accession, term name and term definition. We are also asked to get the matching NCBI IDs for the gene names. So again, if I scroll down in this external reference section, we can then select to show the NCBI IDs. Um, so it's over here. So it's NCBI gene, formerly Entrance gene ID. So I'm going to select this. All of the attributes will become available. So everything that you've selected um, has become available on the left-hand side under the attributes section. So once we're happy with our filters, we're happy with our attributes, we're now going to click on results. So we have our data table over here. And um, so this is our results table. Uh, we have our genes table ID the transcript stable ID, the gene names, um, and then we have the gene ontology, 
information. So we have the term accession, the term name, the definition, and then we also have the matching and CBI IDs for these gene names. By default, Biomart will only show you the first 10 results. But if you want to see all of the results, um, we can, if I just focus on this line that says view, and then we have this drop down menu. Um, so this is set to 10, but if you select all, this is going to open a new window. Um, so it's just going to load and it's going to show you all of the results um, from our query. And I'm just going to wait for this to load. Um, so you'll notice that over here we have, this table is really massive, even though we only processed six gene names. And this is because gene ontology terms are associated with transcripts. So over here, this results table is giving you all of the gene ontology terms associated with the transcripts of the genes that we've provided. And we know that one gene can have more than one transcripts. And this is why this table is massive. So I'm going to close this table for now. And we're going to go back to our original page, so our um, results table. And from here, you have the option to export all results. Um, so you can export them as file, compressed file. Um, you can also export them as compressed web file. If you choose this option, you will have to provide your email in the tab below, and then you can just email the results to yourself. Um, you can also choose the format, so we can um, you can export your results as HTML, comma separated, tab separated, or as XLS. So we've done part of the exercise, but we still need to get the sequences, so the CDNA sequence that matches our gene names. For this, you don't need to create an entire new query. What I'm going to do is I'm just directly going to go to attributes on the left hand side. And I'm going to go to the top. And instead of features now, I'm now going to select sequences. And here I have some, um, this tab that I can expand to choose the different sequences I want. This is selected to pe peptide by default, but we want the cDNA sequence. So I'm going to click on cDNA sequence. And you'll notice when I do that, this graphical representation is going to change to match the cDNA sequence. Um, underneath it, you can also choose your flanking size. So you can choose the upstream or the downstream flanking size. Then we have um, the option to choose header information. So you can choose um, over here to display the gene stable ID. I'm going to unselect this gene stable ID version, uh, but I am going to select gene name because it'll be nice to have the gene name in the header. Um, and then you can also select various different options for the gene and also for the transcript. So for here, I'm going to stay with the transcript ID, but I'm going to remove transcript ID version. All of this, again, has become available on the left-hand side under the attributes. So we have selected for gene stable ID, transcript stable ID, the C we want the cDNA sequence, and we also want the gene name. And now I'm going to click on results. And here we have our cDNA sequence. Um, we have the FASTA header over here with the information about the gene stable ID, the transcript stable ID, and also the gene name. Again, by default, Biomart will only give you the first 10 results. Uh, but if you want to view all of the results, you can select all from this drop down menu. And then you also have the option to export these results in the FASTA format. So, this is everything about Biomart. Um, so, as you can see, it's quite a flexible tool um, and quite useful because you can do various different things with it. Um, before we move on to the exercises, um, I do want to um, say some closing remarks and then 
whatever remaining time we have left, we can use that to do the exercises and for questions. Um, the first thing that I would like to do is that I would like to bring your attention to the feedback survey. So this helps us improve our courses and you also get a certificate at the end of the survey. So I will paste the link to the feedback survey in the Google chat, sorry, the Zoom chat. Um, so it's, you can find it on the training page as well under surveys. Um, so I'll give about five minutes for you to fill the survey out and then I'll come back and I will just um, wrap up today's presentation with a few closing remarks. Uh, 
Um, so we need to come back um, and I hope that everyone was able to fill out the surveys and let's just talk about um, the recap a little bit. So Ensemble is a genome browser that integrates four different types of data. So we have gene annotation, variation, comparative genomics and regulation data. We spoke about gene annotation methods today um, and then um, but we do have longer courses that um, when we have more time, we do um, cover the variation comparative genomics and regulation in a bit more detail. Um, we also have, um, so you can access the Ensemble data using our website. So this includes the main website, but then we also have the um, Ensemble GRCH 37. This is a website that is dedicated to the previous human genome assembly. Um, and then we also have Ensemble Genomes, which is dedicated to non-vertebrates. Uh, we have our archives as well. So these are um, frozen in time for up to five years. So this is where you can find the previous um, Ensemble releases, so the previous versions. Um, you can mine, mine data in groups, um, as I've just shown you in Biomart, but you also have programmatic access to our data via our APIs and MySQL. Finally, you can also download our whole genome files using our FTP site. If you have enjoyed our training, please do recommend us to your friends. Apart from the browser course, we also run the Ensemble REST API course, um, and this teaches you how to access the Ensemble data programmatically via REST API, which is completely language agnostic. And finally, the most important thing from today is um, where to find help. So I've shown you that uh, we have these different, um, um, we have these question mark icons that you can find on the different Ensemble pages that will lead you um, to a help page that gives you a description of what the things on the page, on that specific page would mean. But then apart from that, we also have um, online courses, uh, longer tutorials and flash animations on the EBI pages and also the Ensemble pages. You can also contact us on the help desk. Um, so it's on helpdesk at ensemble.org if you have any issues um, concerning your research or even any recommendations or feedback that you might have regarding Ensemble, we would love to hear from you. So please do drop us an um, email. Um, you can also join our public mailing list to stay in touch and stay updated. We have our social media pages where we update um, about any new um, things that we have um, um, introduced and new releases. And most importantly, Ensemble is completely free, but we would really appreciate your citations as it would help us stay informed about who uses our resources and how. And with this, I would like to thank um, the entire Ensemble team. So it's definitely not just Louise and I, uh, we are a team of um, about 100 people. So various different departments um, who make this work possible and also our funding bodies. Um, I understand that we have about 10 minutes until the end of the session. So Louise and I will stay here um, and then we can also utilize this time for the exercises for Biomart. 
also thank you um, for all of your questions so far. And if you have any more questions, um, we'll be happy to take them. So uh, on behalf of us, I would like to thank you both for uh, a nice workshop. Uh, big applause for, for you all. Uh, uh, very helpful. Uh, of course, we hope to uh, uh, use the information in our lessons too, or maybe when it's very long, I try to invite you uh, to do these lessons to our students if it's possible. Because that can also help uh, in our education program. Uh, I will certainly come back to you and I will meet Ben uh, in June. If you can go on to one of them, uh, hopefully, one of you would also like to attend. So I hope this will all work out uh, for June. Uh, but uh, really, thanks for, uh, for all the help. And I see some of people are leaving at, at one o'clock. The next lesson starts, and we are throughout the whole building. So most probably everybody will leave now. Uh, so, uh, thanks. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Biomarkt was het gebruik ik al jaren. Ik vind het wel toe. Maar in de arm. Dat is een huisje. Oh. Just open the chat box online. Ja. Ah. Dat is een moeilijke vraag geweest. So eventually the, the, the question that uh, Ted asked in the, in the chat was yes. that uh, when we all when we um, uh, develop primers, for instance, for real to PCR, you want primers to be in two different exons. Um, and most of the pro, there was one uh, very interesting uh, software package, but it's uh, it's gone at this moment. Uh, that all uh, that developed the primers and also showed only the primers that were uh, intron spanning. Uh, and now we use different kind of uh, of programs uh, which are online present to develop these primers. But uh, uh, these will just give any primers, and then we have to. Uh, uh, look for these primers, whether they are intron or exon, uh, sorry, intron spanning. Um, and that's the reason why we sometimes look for easy ways to, to have this primer added somewhere that we immediately see, for instance, in the cDNA uh, pictures, oh, these primers are indeed intron or exon spanning. Um, that, so that was, was the question, how uh, is it easy to do that uh, in, in ensemble, for instance? Um. I'm not sure actually. Um, this is something that I would have to relay on to um, the annotators to ask them for it. Um, we obviously have BLAST tool in Ensemble, um, which can also be used, but I don't think we have any specific tool for primer designing. No, but if we have primers that we can just put in a BLAST for a certain gene, and then it will come back where these primers uh, uh, are in the different uh, uh, exons that are written down in the transcripts list, then this would help also. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so you do get a table uh, with Ensemble Blast um, that gives you different information on the different um, hits um, that you might have. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I can... Um, provide information on right now but yeah if, if you could please um email us on help desk yeah. um and then we can look into it further and i can ask my colleagues about it as well because mm -hmm. I, I um you know i don't want to say if there is perhaps more information available then i would like you to have it and i would like to help obviously i, I will look at the last option first because what i did now i, I also asked the students for uh uh, last time is that we just download the sequence from a certain cDNA, but then with the uh, intron uh, with the exon uh, changes within another color. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, looking at the configuration, you can just only use the sequence and you have two colors. But then if you download the sequence, the colors are gone. But if you copy the sequence, the colors are still there. Yeah. Then you can 
look for the primers and see that they are in action spanning. But I will also look at your blast uh, option and see if we can just add these two primers and see how they come up with uh, in the blast session. Uh, and if I, uh, I will do that in June, I think, because then I will start to refresh my lessons for after the summer. Um, and then if I still uh, have some additional questions, I will just certainly uh, send an email. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, in theory, it should work, but yeah, give it a go. And if it doesn't work, you can always just email us as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. I, I'm going to uh, to uh, close this part of the session, so we will leave the the, the, the room uh, on top where we zoom in sometimes when we wait. Um, and uh, yeah, hoping to meet you again uh, sometime. And uh, and thanks for this uh, marvelous uh, workshop. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Bye.